Well, welcome to um, part two of our talk on osteoporosis. In the first part, we really talked about how to maintain healthy bones by using all of the um, environmental factors that you can use, such as um, having adequate vitamin D and calcium, as well as doing strength and resistance exercise. But the next part of osteoporosis treatment is all around diagnosis and uh, prevention. Now, in order to diagnose osteoporosis, you can do this in one of two ways. You can either diagnose it clinically in somebody who's had what we would call a low trauma fracture or a fragility fracture. This is a fracture that occurs um, with almost no or very low trauma. So as we spoke about in the last episode, this would be something like just tripping over on the footpath, putting out your hand and breaking your wrist. That's what we would consider a low trauma fracture and that would earn you the diagnosis of osteoporosis. But it can also be made from a radiological perspective or an imaging perspective, and that's using a bone mineral density test. Now, this is a test that essentially is like a low dose X-ray of all the bones in the body. And it looks in particular at the bones in the lumbar vertebrae, so the lower vertebrae, the bones in the hip, and in some instances, the bones in the forearm. And by assessing the density of those bones, it can tell you where you sit on a spectrum of, um, of bone density or osteoporosis. So that spectrum ranges from normal bone to what we would term osteopenia, which is sort of the intermediate bone density, and then on the lower end of the spectrum, um, the osteoporosis. So if you've received a diagnosis of osteoporosis, either clinically or radiologically, um, the next stage is working out what risk you're at for having another fracture. So having had one fracture or being osteoporotic makes you significantly more likely to have another fracture in the future. And because of that, we would usually recommend treatment, particularly if you cross a, a certain threshold. So there are a wide variety of treatments that are available. Most of these treatments reduce your future risk of fracture by about 50%, which is on, on balance a pretty good risk reduction. The first of these options for treatment is what we call menopause hormone therapy. You might mention, sorry, you might remember from my previous talk that we mentioned that being of an older age or being postmenopausal predisposes you to osteoporosis. And the reason for this is because of the loss of estrogen. So if we replace that estrogen around the time of menopause, and in particular, if you're having the vasomotor symptoms that um, occur at the same time um, of the menopause, you can sometimes find, or we, we certainly do see, that there is an improvement um, in bone density, or at least a maintenance of bone density over time. Now, there are obviously some concerns around menopause hormone therapy, in particular concerns around the risk of breast cancer, future risk of stroke and heart disease. But in the young woman under the age of 60, generally it's very safe to commence menopause hormone therapy on an individual basis once you've decided what her risk benefit um, ratio might be. Now the menopause hormone therapy is available in a number of options, so there are oral tablets, um, but there are also transdermal patches as well as transdermal gels, and increasingly we're using the transdermal route um, because of its safety profile. Once you're over the age of 60, it's less easy to commence menopause hormone therapy. In fact, it's not really recommended in that age group. And so we have to think of a number of other options to treat the um, osteoporosis that a, a patient might present with. There are a number of um, different therapies, primarily the bisphosphonate therapies, which are certainly those therapies that we would recommend commencing um, as first line. These are tablets that you can take either weekly or monthly, or an intravenous infusion that you can take once a year. 
As I mentioned before, these reduce your risk of fracture by 50%. We also have a subcutaneous injection called denosumab, which is very popular for its ease of use. But denosumab does have a very risky side effect that I will talk about um, in a minute. And finally, there's a very new medication out, one that is called teriparatide. It's an injection that you would give yourself every day at home for 18 months. And it's what we call an anabolic medication. It's a medication that builds bone. Now, there are quite a few hoops to jump through to get this on the PBS, um, but it is available um, in, the, in patients who might be able to access it. The most common concern of patients um, or that patients express to me is really around the side effect profile of all of these bone medications. Now, I want to be so very reassuring about these. The two side effects that people find when they Google bisphosphonates or denosumab online are the side effects of osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is just a fancy name for saying a necrotic non-healing ulcer that's essentially within the jaw and atypical femur fracture, which is a spontaneous fracture of one of the long bones in the leg. Now, the atypical femur fracture is really mainly, um, or mainly occurs in the setting of using bisphosphonates and denosumab at high doses in cancer patients. So it's very, very rare that we would see this, about one in 10,000 in the normal osteoporosis population. The risk of the atypical femur fracture is about one in a thousand, and it's seen with long-term use of bisphosphonates or denosumab. Now, by long-term, I mean more than 10 years, and we certainly don't do that. Increasingly, we do um, five years of therapy with a little a therapy or medication holiday for a year or two in between in order to allow the bone to refresh itself. So very often when we're thinking about treatment, we have to weigh up what is your true fracture risk? And for somebody who is 75, has maybe had one previous fracture and a family history of osteoporosis, they may have a fracture risk of two in 10 or three in 10 versus the one in a thousand risk of the atypical femur fracture. You can see that the benefit of having the treatment far outweighs the risk of this atypical femur fracture. And in that setting, we would very much recommend treatment. But as with everything in medicine, this is an individual conversation for you to have with your GP or with your endocrinologist. What we want is to prevent those future fractures. So something I noticed when I was in my training and certainly now in my consultant days is that patients who present with a hip fracture, if you ask their history, they'll tell you that 10 or 15 years prior to that, they presented with a wrist fracture after they had a, a, a fall in the park or um, doing something um, that wasn't a, a very high trauma incident. If we had picked them up at that first instance, it may be that we would have delayed um, their, their hip fracture or maybe even prevented it altogether. So hopefully this has been useful for you. Remember we've got lifestyle factors, vitamin D, calcium and exercise, but those aren't going to protect the bones in their entirety. So really important to also have um, a conversation with your GP or your endocrinologist about the various bone protecting medications that are available for you. Thank you.